All righty, folks. Day five of our 10 day boot camp. Uh, we are lucky enough to have the one and only Derek, that ADU guy. Uh, this was actually a request by the audience when we were doing our day zero conversations. Uh, there were questions about ADUs. There were questions about house hacking. There were all kinds of questions. But uh, when you talk about ADUs, there's only one guy that I go to, and that is Derek, that ADU guy. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Let's uh, get this thing going. Looking forward to uh, hopefully helping a ton of your students here. Yeah. And just so you know, folks, we are going to put this on my channels. I believe Derek is on a mission, and I want to support him on that mission of doing how many how many ADUs are you trying to influence again? the The goal is to influence one million ADUs in my lifetime, and I plan to live a very long time. Um, I think we're 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 maybe a tenth of the way towards that goal. Uh, so we'll see. Yeah. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna go on that mission with them, uh, a million units. So obviously, all the students here will be able to ask questions. We will be putting this on the best of ORAT channel later today and a little sneak peek. It'll go on the main channel in a week. Uh, yes, I am selfishly trying to grow that channel. Best of ORAT. Uh, you need subs and you need watch hours. So taking two hours of content with Derek will certainly help that. Uh, Derek, why don't we step back and kind of rewind the clock to when you first heard about ADUs? What were you doing? Um, you know, this is a, a new thing to a lot of folks, but you have been in it for quite a while. So when did it first come across your radar that this could be, um, this should be a mission or this is even a thing? Great question. So I was just lucky enough to grow up in a small town in Southern Oregon where way before any state had overarching state law that said this is allowable. They had a code here. I was um, like 14 years old. I was in high school and my wood shop teacher handpicked a group of misfit kids that he could see weren't probably going to go to college and started a construction technology class. And we built an ADU for one of our other high school teachers. Um, so when I talk about ADU strategies and the ADU mission, um, I, I just got lucky to live in a spot where it was an allowable use. And I started an apprenticeship right after high school. I got my contractor's license when I was 19 and spent the first several years of my career um, being the, the back in the muscle for the investor before it ever occurred to me that I could do this for myself and build long-term wealth and then later teach people how to do it. Yeah. So um, that's amazing, right? So lucky enough to find a teacher who had this belief, 14 years old. And again, what? so that was what, 20 years ago-ish? Yeah, twenty, almost 28 years. This is 1995 was 95. the first um, build process we started. And that was a separate structure, right? Not a garage conversion or anything. No. It was a separate house. Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was actually permitted and built as a detached shed with electrical and plumbing. And then after the inspection was done, it was converted from the, the, the shed to a guest house. <laughs> um, you know, for a lot of years, we did what we call legacy ADUs, but now we have this amazing code in a lot of states that supports these outright. So it, it, it pays to do the proper permitting. Right. So fast forward a little bit. When do you break ground on your first ADU? Great question. So I was um, getting started in my first investments in 2002 to 2004, and I didn't really start putting the, the pedal to the metal until about 2008. Okay. Uh, also, I think there's something that's morphed, obviously, yourself. Thatch, uh, Thatch also talks a lot about ADUs, Thatch Nguyen. Mm -hmm. um, I guess there's kind of three types of ADUs today. In like When we think about the jargon in the industry, mm -hmm. right, there's the detached kind of mother-in-law. There's the, I think it's a JADU, which I think is a garage conversion. And then there's kind of a structural change. Um, why, don't you, why don't you just talk about the different ways that, you know, there are around ADUs? Yeah, wonderful. So everybody in the audience today, like I want you to know that we're going to answer your direct questions for your direct scenario. So if you're like, oh, I don't care about attic ADUs, don't worry, we're going to get to your specific case. And then if this is um, being watched later by people, feel free to comment here or reach out to me. I'll answer your direct questions. Again, I want to help you, not just like what I think. Uh, real quick, though, to be direct with that question, we're looking at attached ADUs. Um, if you're a first time home buyer, I'm probably going to try to point you into uh, the space of find a, a spot in the primary house that you can convert without extending any walls at all. So that's an interior ADU. That could be a basement, an attic, a master bedroom, a bonus room. We also have garage conversion ADUs. It can be attached or detached. We're going to take that one or two car garage and turn it into legal living space. And then the third and the cream of the crop and what I focus on is the new 
detached standalone unit. So those are kind of how I break them down. There's there's five or six types, but it's either um, attached, some kind of conversion, a conversion of a garage, or a new build. And really, what we've seen again, you're you were decades ahead of um, you know this challenge or this mission of yours is you were a decade ahead, but now we're seeing states and cities and counties really look at ADUs as a way to solve affordable housing, right? Adding more uh, square footage uh, for folks. And uh, I think there's a lot of right way and wrong ways to do ADUs. Um, why don't you kind of talk about, actually, you know what? Let's hit the wrong way first, right? There are some things that I've bounced into, right? you've helped me through, um, you know, some things that you should try to avoid around ADUs. Um, why don't we hit those first and then we'll get on, you know, to the next step, all the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So some red flags first and foremost is, is zoning. It's zoning. We're, we're building a business here. We're trying to do um, legal workforce housing that's fully permitted. So our tenant has a nice safe place that's been inspected for life safety code. If somebody gets hurt, um, we're protected because we have proper insurance because it's a legal use and we have a certificate of occupancy. So the number one mistake I see people make is buying a house that they think has an ADU because realtors, are there any realtors in here? Just nod your yes. head if you're a realtor. Okay, there, don't, some realtors. don't swing at me, but realtors <laughs> oftentimes misrepresent properties. They they say, you know, they, they price, they market, and they sell a house as house with ADU, and then come to find out it's a house with an illegal existing use that's not permitted. So always make sure that ADUs are a permitted use, not in your town, not in your state. Like, you know, every residential lot pretty much in California has to allow an ADU by right, but that doesn't mean that you're in residential zone, not in a commercial zone. It doesn't mean that there's not an easement through your backyard where you were going to build it. So always make sure that the zoning is correct. Another couple of things that I, I tell people um, can really ruin your plan is um, HOAs or historic districts yes. or no parking. I mean, per state law, you may not need an off-street parking spot depending on where you live, but your tenants are still going to need a place to park. So you don't dump a bunch of time and money into this product where it's going to be really hard to rent because it's not accessible. So those are a few of the big ones that I tell people to watch out for. Um, another one is um, a historic district. When you're in a historic district, a lot of times there's design standards, there's architectural review um, requirements. There's just all these, these hard things. So we're going to break this into two boxes as we go today. One of them is I'm a new investor. I have a house. I know I can do an ADU with this house. What's the best and most affordable option for me to drive the highest yield. And the other is what I would call my, um, my, let me get them here. My ADU goggles approach. And I'm going to put these on to look like a goofball and give you guys a visual. Okay, so these are my ADU goggles, and I want everybody at the end of today to be able to put on a similar pair of goggles and look at a property in a way that you've never looked at it before. And that's where we get the biggest advantage because we can focus in and, and just zoom in to exactly what we want. We don't have to swing at called strikes. We don't have to swing at low or high pitches. We can just wait for that perfect pitch right down the middle, which is an ADU um, ready property that I'll go over. Yeah. So um, I think there's a, another thing that, again, I've stumbled uh, across these until you started coaching me, right? The historic district obviously got me. There's a little little postage size stamp in Fresno, California called the Tower District that has um, extreme regulation. And uh, I tried to fight my way through that. And it was just it was just the wrong property, right? It should, I should have fixed something else. So thank you for the coaching on that. The other one that I stumbled across, again, just being an overexcited investor going, wow, this is the way for me is in Fresno. I believe I remember this, right? The ADU could be a maximum size of like 1200 square feet. So what did I do? I went out and designed a 1200 square foot ADU, not realizing again, your coaching helped me see this later that that might not be the best return. Right. And we went back and forth. And I think in my example, the the right square footage was more like 650 or 660 square feet, right? It was the it was the two two or the two two plus a den, something of that nature. So, you know, I would I would strongly suggest kind of new folks getting excited. Don't go for the maximum size. Do the math, and maybe the maximum size isn't the right answer. That's that was something I found. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. We'll we'll get into that uh, a little bit, hopefully, when we talk about pricing and and how to keep these affordable. Um, but bigger is not better. 
in most cases, there are a few examples. I mean, if somebody has beachfront property in San Diego, we're going to say we're going to do everything we can and, and suck uh, on every financial um, spot you have to get that money. But in most cases, no, smaller is better. And the the number one mistake, um, maybe the number two mistake after buying an area that's not properly zoned is over designing and over building your ADU, which in turn is going to drive your yield down. If you guys were all homeowners, um, like in the Oakland Hills with your dream home, we would be looking at different ways to create this product. But since we're on one rental at a time and we're following what, what Zuber's doing, we obviously know uh, what a buy box is. We know what yield is. And we're trying to make money while still producing nice workforce, workforce housing. I call it capitalism with compassion, but we're trying to make a profit. Yeah, capitalism with compassion. I've heard you say that before. I love that phrase. And again, that, that's just, so now let's switch to, you know, how do we do that? Right. What are some kind of rules of thumb? How do we how do we get the best return? What are some things to look out for? What is what's kind of the checklist that you in your ADU goggles go through to say, yeah, that's one I should look at and maybe I'll skip that other one. Yeah, great. So that's that's what I want to focus on right now is don't get this confused with I have a house in California where I can build an ADU and I want to do that. Let's let's look at this as I'm looking for a property that will be good to deploy the strategy. So the yes. things that I'm always looking for are uh, the right zoning period. And if you don't know the zoning in your area, we have people from all across the country here, um, call your local planning and zoning department, introduce yourself. If it's a big department, it doesn't matter if you're in Dallas, Texas, or you're in some tiny little town in Mississippi, call your planning and zoning office and tell them, Hey, I'm a, I'm an investor or I'm a house flipper or um, a blue collar worker that wants to convert or build an ADU. What zones in this city, whatever city you're shopping in, can I build an accessory dwelling unit? And can you please send me the standards? So nobody likes to hear this. Nobody talks about it. We don't see it on Instagram. Nobody ever gets out of a Lamborghini and holds up a, a zoning code book, but it's the rule book for how we make money in real estate period. So you have to know your zoning first. Don't even go shopping until you know where you can do this. A simple strategy is to ask the zoning department to send you a zoning map. And it's literally a, a map of the city that's different colors. And you'll know what color to go, to go shopping in uh, per se. Other things that are really important, um, prices last. I want to say this first, like prices, it, it's got to make sense, but we don't look at the price. If anybody follows what Warren Buffett does, or at least used to do, he used to read annual reports and he would look at businesses and then he would give the business a valuation in his mind before he ever looked at the stock price. And I want everybody to kind of think about that strategy as we look at um, at properties for this, for this, um, this housing type and this asset class. Uh, so zoning is correct. Now we're going to start looking for... Um, areas. Location, location, location are the three most important things in real estate. That doesn't mean you have to go buy in the bluffs in Malibu, but in your area, buy in the best location that you can afford. The strategy, even if it's a simple conversion, is going to take some time and some money, and it's not going to be easy. If it was easy, everybody would do this. So if you're going to deploy that time and energy and get a few gray hairs, do it in an area that's that's a good area that you would want to live in, that you would want to rent in, that you would feel fine putting your family in. Um, a couple other things that I always am looking for is infrastructure. So it's one thing that's so underrated that nobody ever talks about. Like, it doesn't matter if you can buy a house for 60% of ARV, if you have to replace the sewer line and you have to upgrade the electrical panel and the water line is galvanized from 1930 and it's a one inch line that's rusted interior and it's down to like, you know, a toothpick would barely flow through it. Those are things that I see all the time as a you know 30 year contractor. So we're looking for infrastructure. I can't, uh, emphasize this one enough. We always want to do a great due diligence. So two to $500, it's going to cost to scope your sewer pipe. That's one of my secret weapons is never buy a house without scoping the sewer line. It doesn't matter if it's brand new construction. We see these every day. We have root intrusion. We've got pipe degradation, even a new construction. This happens often. Like the, the concrete contractor will show up to do the driveway and they'll back up with the skid steer and run over the clean out and it'll fill up with gravel. New homeowner will move in within a week. They have sewage backed up into their tub on the lowest floor. So the sewer line um, infrastructure, we're looking for good and you don't have to be a contractor to understand this stuff. Just when the scope our sewer that's on your checklist, you need to check the electrical panel. 
uh, ideally we want it to be like 1970s and newer. That's the kind of properties I look for. That's kind of my cutoff. I'll buy houses that were built in the forties and fifties, but the first, you know, grade on my uh, buy box is going to be 1970s and newer. It already has that electrical panel that's upgraded. We don't want thread in. We definitely don't want knob and tube. We want a normal electrical panel that has breakers. Okay. So uh, those are some big ones. A couple others that I'm looking for is a flat lot and then access. So if you're in California, let's just use Fresno for a good example. They have an amazing ADU code. They have pre-approved plans. Their city is semi-approachable, but they have a lot of good flat lots with either corner or alley access. So I really like those. If you're in an area, like I live in a small mountain town in Southern Oregon, and, and one side of our boulevard is really steep and the other side is flat. I buy in the flat areas because when it comes to my strategy of new standalone grade or slope starts to get really expensive. The couple other things that I'm looking for are uh, good parking. And I like a little bit of space between my neighbors if I can get it. So those are some basics of what I look for if I'm shopping for a property where I'm going to deploy this strategy. If it's uh, an, an interior ADU, like I'm a first time home buyer or I'm a new investor and I want to do the affordable ADU, let's just call it thirty to $100,000 is what it's going to cost to convert part of a house. I'm looking for um, a house that would work for the strategy. It doesn't have to be a 5,000 square foot, five bedroom, five bath that everybody thinks. It could be a three bedroom, two bath in a normal kind of track house neighborhood, but we're looking for anywhere in that house that already has a bathroom. So it could be a bonus room that has a bathroom off of it. It could be a master bedroom. The master bedroom is the easiest one. Look for a house that has a master bedroom that doesn't share any walls with any other bedroom in the house. Preferably it has an exterior entrance where your tenant can walk down the side of the house and get into that uh, unit. So those are a few of the, the basics that I'm looking for when I'm looking for attached or detached. But um, again, focusing in really, really uh, directly on is an allowable use in the zone and is it in a good location and is the infrastructure gonna be easy? Because the last thing we wanna do is buy a cheap house and then have to replace all this stuff. And all of a sudden, not only is, is, it, is it more than we would have paid for a property that had good infrastructure, it's our time that we lost getting it back up to there. After all that is done, then we're gonna analyze rents and we're gonna look at purchase price and we're gonna come up with yield. So don't, don't always start there. Um, that's a mistake I see people make. No, it's absolutely, you know, doing the ADU route it is about homework, location, you know, all of these, the checklists you go through and then kind of what, what is the best yield, right? What uh, capitalism with uh, compassion. I love that phrase. Um, and my, but let's talk about, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, I don't want to, I don't want to over talk. I want to be able to, again, get yeah. direct questions. that will help people. But some things that I don't want to forget is we can pay more than our competition. Like we can pay more because we know the stored energy potential in that unit. We can pay, we can, I literally never get a deal. I've never got one of those sweetheart deals that you hear about. Oh, I bought it for 60% of ARV minus repairs minus 10%. Like I've never done that. I've always bought something that's like fair market value. Sometimes I'll even offer more because the power is in the purchase is what the property will do. So I don't care about price. I, I care about what it will produce. And now there's some amazing products out there. They just, you know, released this new Freddie Fannie. The agency lenders are going to start uh, allowing um, duplex, triplex, quadplex with 5% down before it was 15 or 20 or 25%, depending on your lender. And even better, FHA financing is now allowing 75% of gross rents of that ADU to count towards your DTI to qualify for that, that loan. So talk to Matt, the mortgage guy, talk to, I mean, we've, we've got a bunch of lenders in the network. They'll all be up on this new stuff, but just don't think if you're pre-approved for say $300,000 that you can't afford an ADU house that's 400,000 if it's already done, because you can, you can use that income to qualify. So we can shop a little bit out, like we can kind of bat out of our league, if you will, if we have this ADU and it doesn't have to be permitted. If it's if if the appraiser can show marketability and they can show two other unpermitted ADUs in your area, they can give you value for that. Just make sure it's in an area where ADUs are permitted. So when you purchase it, hopefully you can you can negotiate your price down because you're a zoning expert and you know this ADU is not permitted, but you know you can get it permitted. You get a deal on it, you'd call for a special inspection, you get it permitted, and you know, you can pay more than other people. Yeah. So why don't we talk about an example, right? So again, you're you're going to pay market price for something because your ADU goggles 
you know, you can kind of see the future. Why don't we run through a, a you know, a deal you did recently just to show the power, um, you know, of those ADU goggles. I, I like that imagery. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just do a, I'll, I'll do a basic attached ADU unit. So we looked at a property that was what I would call kind of like a Frankenstein house. It was just a big house. It was, had some functional, um, functional obsolescence, the, you know, the market would call it. But for us, that's perfect. If, if there's like one wing of your house, that's kind of weird. This house was built in 1996. Uh, the architect that designed this house in this, this town, this is just a median price point house too. And, and I found this out later from the neighbors, but the architect that had designed this house was like 23. He was brand new out of school. This was his first ever set of blueprints. And he designed this kind of big gaudy house. And in the the nineties, it was kind of like the birth of the McMansion kind of cheaply built houses that were just big and had a lot of volume. And there was a portion of the house on the left side that was a second living room and a second dining room. It didn't have my signature bathroom already there, but I can put in a bathroom pretty affordably as a builder. So uh, there was about 500 square feet that was completely, you know, on its own. It shared that that shared wall was with a entryway in the back side of a kitchen. So this wouldn't have been as good of a strategy if this big area that I'm like, oh, this is perfect to convert happened to be sharing walls with the bedrooms because then we have to do more mitigation for sound. So I'm always looking at sound and privacy. Um, I also scoped the sewer. I knew that the sewer line, the three inch ABS pipe that carries waste out of the house was right underneath that section of the house in the crawl space that happened to also be right where the water line came in. So I knew instantly that I could cut a hole in the floor and my water sewer power is all right there. We didn't have to take infrastructure, you know, a long ways. So that was what made that um, uh, kind of a go. And then it had great parking. There's plenty of parking. And it was in an area that the city loves accessory dwelling units, both attached and detached. And even as a more seasoned investor, I'm always looking for an attached ADU possibility as well, because in my market, we can do two of them. But if you do two, one has to be attached. So ideally, we want a product that is high demand, low supply, and tenants want exactly what we want as homeowners, homeowners, in my opinion, in this order. They want location, privacy, and amenities. And we can get that, um, we can capture more of that with the detached unit, but the attached unit is also nice because it's it's our bonus one. So that was what I was looking for. That's what I found. I'll remind everybody that this was on the market. It was on the MLS. Uh, every realtor in our area looked at it. Every investor looked at it. It was on the market for two or three weeks and it was overpriced um, for most people. But what I saw was the ability to do this internal conversion in a spot that was very basic. We, we did it for $28,500. Uh, the lot was also 300 feet deep. So we were able to split the lot and put a new lot of record in the back where I also built a house in two ADUs. So we took this single family house that was overpriced that nobody wanted. And we turned it into five legal rental units um, with close to $600,000 of equity and enough cash flow to retire somebody on you know a, a pretty basic budget. So they're all over the place. They're hidden in plain sight. We just have to look at things that other people aren't looking for. Use your own analogy or, or get your own visual for how you're gonna look at these places, but they're, they're, um, they're everywhere and it's powerful. So, let, so I want to break this down, right? So it's online. You see it. It probably comes. So you found it, not an agent or someone did this. You saw it online. I found it. Yeah. 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 So well, you, that's a good, that's a really good question. I'm not going to talk long here, but I just want, I want to pause this. This is in an area. This was like a couple blocks from, from where I was building and living at the time. So keep your eyes open. You don't have to drive for dollars and have an app. Just like pay attention. Mm -hmm. So I've been driving by this house for years. And I saw it get, you know, kind of more and more overgrown and there was an RV parked in the driveway and it wasn't a dilapidated, I wouldn't call it a distressed property, but I had my eye on it. And there's no reason that everybody here can't be like looking at, at properties. Maybe you can't afford it. Maybe you're not ready to buy. That doesn't mean that you're not paying attention. So years later, this thing popped on the market and I saw it and um, the rest was history. So, okay. So you, so you found it on, you find it online. What caught your attention? Was it the square footage, the price days on market? What, what was the first, like, because at this point you're driving by it. So you know the house, but you don't know the interior. You don't know the layout. You don't know how big, deep the backyard is probably. Right. But what was it that caught your attention? 
Yeah, exactly. Great question. So that's that was my checklist. Okay, it's it's 1970s and newer. It was built in like okay. 94 or 96. It had a flat lot. Okay, it had plenty of parking. There okay. was a there's a power pole right in front of the house with a new transformer. So I know there's enough power to do what I want to do. Uh, it's in a great location. And it's in a city that I've already studied the zoning code where I know they love 2A to use. Okay. And all right. So like now every, everything. Yeah. So now, boxes. so now you get in, you probably reach out to a local agent or maybe the listing agent and you walk the house. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing. Right. Yes. Cause you're not right. Yeah. You don't write an offer yet. You're, you're no, uh -uh. you right. Cause you got to go through the house. So when you're walking through the house again with your ADU goggles, I'm guessing you're looking for that extra square footage kind of by itself, right? The 500 square feet, the second living, second dining. Those, that's what you're looking for, for first, right? Kind of interior design. Is that is that right? Yeah. Normally, I would be looking for a spot in the house that has a bathroom. Right. So may, I, usually I would go straight to the mat. I'll, I'll, I'll backtrack. But if once I'm inside, I usually go straight to the master, period. Okay. This one, I didn't have to. I opened the door and was like, I'll take it. It was, it was so obvious. Um, if we back up real quick, and I, I don't want to get sidetracked, I want you to to keep me corralled here, Zuber. Huh? But it starts outside. Again, I don't look okay. at price. I don't look at the backsplash. I don't care what the bathrooms look like. I don't care what, if there's even any appliances. Like I'm looking for people uh, things that other people aren't. So the the first thing I'm looking for is I do a 360 around the house. And this okay. is a four inch uh, sewer line. It's never been used. Yep. It's clean. I promise. But <laughs> yeah. this would come up out of the ground within five feet of the perimeter of the house per code on any house that's like 1970s and newer. And this is the clean okay. out. So this is where if you have a backup in your line, the plumber would come out, they would pull the cap off and they would put a camera down this or they would put a, a rotor router down this. Mm -hmm. um, this. This is the key for me. This is where is the sewer line and how deep is it? So my 360 around this house, the first thing I did is I, I found this. Okay. I found the water meter. So I know where the sewer is going into the house. I pull the cap mm. off. I look down. I know how deep it is. I know. So, so tell me about that. So, what do you mean? How? I mean, I, I have no idea what the code is. Are we talking four or five feet, or what? What do you mean when you say how deep? No, it is? What no, any, anywhere from twelve inches to thirty-six inches is is a, a standard depth of how deep a sewer line comes out of a house. Um, oh, okay. It could be up to six feet. It could be sixteen inches. But the point is that um, sewer lines they flow downhill. We can pump right. sewer, but you know, a quarter They're inch, tilted, yeah. a foot of grade is the slope we want. We don't want it too steep because then the liquids will outrun the solids. Um, so I'm looking for the infrastructure. Okay. It's all about Got infrastructure. It. So I find this and I find out how deep it is. That way I know the, the backyard could be 500 feet deep, but if my sewer line at the house is only 12 inches deep, I can only go about 30 feet back because of that mm. slope calculation. I see where the water is coming into the house. I also on that 360 around the exterior, I look at the, the panel. And if okay. it's an exterior mounted panel, I'll open it up and I'll look at the fuses and see if there's room, you know, can we tap in with a double hundred amp to run power out to our next unit? So I'm okay. looking at, at, at like construction minded things that people don't see. Realtors don't know this stuff. <clears throat> and then I'm looking at the backyard. I'm looking at slope. I'm looking at drainage, like water will kill a deal. Like make mm -hmm. sure that your storm water is going somewhere. So these, these little things that nobody else is looking for. And then when I walk in the house, that's when I usually go straight towards the master bathroom, uh, master bedroom bath, or an area that's a bonus room. That's where I go. I don't look at the garage. That's kind of last. I don't look at backsplash or kitchen or finishes or what shape the hardwood floor is in. I don't care. I'm looking for, for the, the bathroom. Okay. So now you're going through the house and this one, you find these two rooms. You also did your exterior. So you know where the lines are and um, you know what? So you said earlier, I think it was, 28,500 to kind of create that second unit. Do I have that number right? Did I write that down? Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's correct. So what was, so again, you're a contractor. Let's be clear. The average person, what do you think an average, like if you did it for 28, you know, contractors have margin, right? Cost plus. What do you think an average consumer would have gotten a contractor to bid that out? 40 grand, 35? No, double, double my number. Every number you okay. hear me quote, just double it for you. Okay. And that's, okay. that's after you shop around and you, you, have educated meetings with people and I'm going to teach you guys how to find good contractors. So don't worry. Um, but you, you can so call it 60 rent. grand. So call it yes. 60 grand. Okay. Yep. What did that, what did that unit rent for? Uh, that unit rents for 1250 and it nets a thousand a month. Okay. Wow. So again, you're, th this is why I think ADUs are going to be the answer for lots of folks, including myself. 
is you can get those kinds of returns. But again, that it that's only the beginning of the story, right? Because that now you have two units. What did the big house rent for? The bigger portion. The big house. The big house rents for twenty two fifty. Right. So this is again your whole point about we can pay more and in, and in, in, you know maximize way value. more. Way more. And that house, had I not touched it and I would have just left it at 2,400 square feet with that extra space, it probably would have rented for 2,450. So right. I lost $200 to gain 12. Right. That's a net $1,000 gain. And it's also uh, another thing I'll say about this strategy if you're going to do an internal conversion. And for all intents and purposes, you're doing either a side by side or an over under duplex on one of these conversions. Um, you're in an amazing area. So zoning rules and regulations, 30s, 40s, 50s, they came out with all these rules to keep black and brown and poor people out of these neighborhoods. It was awful. It was like, how do we keep the riffraff out of the nice sides of town? It was with zoning. And so traditionally, we've put poor people like by the railway, by the water treatment plant, downtown where it's loud, under the overpass, things like that. And these, these single family neighborhoods were kind of kept for the more elite and again, this is awful. This is unfortunate. And it's great that we're starting to break that barrier now. But these properties that we're doing, we're going to have this kind of duplex-ish property, but it's in a great area with a lot more open space, more desirable, higher values. So very similar to a duplex, but um, that that's one thing that I like to remind people is, is you're probably going to be doing this in a better area. And then you talked about this property. You did a lot split. I have never done a lot split. What mm -hmm. um, What is that cost timeline? possibilities you know why did it work here yeah good question it works because the same legislation that cities states counties and really the country is pushing is more density more infill so infill is just real quickly we have these city limits or an urban growth boundary of any city call it fresno or or wherever we're at we'll use fresno for an example and inside that urban growth boundary is the city limit usually a little bit smaller and inside that city limit we already have water lines sewer lines power lines fire hydrants street lights, sidewalks, fire department, police, and cities don't want urban sprawl. They don't want us moving out into the high valued farmland and chopping down orchards. We'll just say they're, they're oranges um, outside of Fresno or olives, whatever we got. We want to infill these large, big backyards. So the ADU strategy is what I'm known for, but a lot of what I do is, is land hacking as well. So I'm buying in single family zones within the city limits that have big yards. And, you know, 20 years ago, the minimum lot size in X district in Fresno might have been 10,000 square feet. You know, everybody in the tower district has this nice big long backyard with an alley mm -hmm. that, that accesses the back. Well, as we update our codes, as um, you know, California has just done, as Oregon's done, Washington, Montana, the, the West Coast, the more expensive states are ahead of everybody else because they're, they have more um, constituent pressure to solve the housing crisis. We're reducing lot sizes. So 10 years ago, the minimum lot size was 10,000 square feet. Now the minimum lot size is 5,000 square feet. So what else are we looking for on top of 1970s and newer, flat, good zoning, good infrastructure, good area? We're also looking for lots that are at least twice the minimum lot size. Once we find that, um, it takes in my area, it takes about six months. You have to hire a surveyor. You have to do some kind of preliminary plat application with the city. Again, they're telling us how to do it because we've made a relationship with our city. That's where we started, right? Everybody here should call their city planner, their city planning and zoning office tomorrow. Like do this, call the, the office. Hey, I'm new to the area. I'm a new investor. I want to do this. I want to do that. Can you, can you send me the, the code? Make friends with the decision makers, read your zoning code. It's the rule book of how we make money in real estate. Um, but there's a process in there for lot splits. You read it, you hire a surveyor, maybe a land use planner to help you do it six months and two to $6,000 is what I see on average. And you can use that to, to leverage your project. Hey, I can't afford to, to convert the ADU. We just bought the house. Well, split the lot, sell the lot to somebody like Zuber and that funded your deal or sell the house and build your dream home on the lot. Like it just gives us one more tool that, that very few people are doing. And in all honesty, it's easier than most strategies. Everybody like wants to fix and flip because that's what we see on TV. And quite frankly, like that's way, way harder than building a new house. And there's way more variables. Um, so don't be afraid to like, you know, look at some of these other options that very few people are doing. So let's let's go back to the goggle analogy. Cause again, I think there's, you know, obviously if five thousand is minimum, you want 10, 12,000, but it also probably matters where the house is positioned, right? The main house, the main structure. Um, because you have to have, you know, setbacks and all of those things. Is that fair? Yep. Yeah. Again, knowing the the zoning code, um, let's just call some some averages nationally. So if you have a lot, 
usually a front setback is anywhere from 15 to 20 feet off of the front property line. We'll just call an average side setback anywhere between three and six feet minimum. And then there's usually a rear lot setback of anywhere from five to 12 feet. So you can't just stick a corner right on the property line or a house right on the property lines. In California, there's some cool new you know legislation that if there's already an existing building there, as long as you don't go up, uh, you can rebuild it in place. If you're right on a property line, like a zero lot line, there are some codes that will let you just fireproof that wall that's too close. So you have to um, understand your zoning code and every area is different. Like if, I, if I'm a, a zoning code expert in my area, which I am, and I go to another area, I have to like relearn it all because it's different. There's different rules. There's different decision makers. The, the language is different. So don't think like, oh, Derek does this every day. No wonder he knows. No, no, I know because I go spend a couple hours reading the code and I call and I ask a few questions and then I know. Yeah. What's cool about that is anybody on here can do that. Like everybody I'm looking at right now, can become an expert in their local zoning code in their little niche in a day or two. You just got to yeah. put in the work. I mean, where's the hat? He's not wearing it. Do the work, do the work. I tell myself that I'm not trying to be bossy to you guys. Like I say that so I can remind myself, like do the work. Yeah. So I want to finish the story, right? Cause you bought a house, a single and it became five. So yeah, you bought the house, you 28, mm -hmm. five, we're going to put it in for 60. That's two. You do the lot split. Uh, where do the other three units come in? Uh, so I just um, applied for permits to build a single, a new single family house and yeah. an attached ADU. But because I'm picky and I like non-shared walls, I attach my attached units with a breezeway. So they're actually not connected uh -huh. wall to wall. They're connected with a breezeway between the two. And, um, and then after I built the second one, I built the house in the detached ADU. Uh, we put long-term fixed rate debt on that. And then we built the third detached unit later. That was before agency loans would give you um, really good value on that third unit. It's still so new in the in the federal regulation world for lending that it's hard to get funding for, for all three. So this was kind of a, a hybrid, um, how we built out the back lot. So when you're all said and done, you went from, I think you said earlier, it would have been like 2,600. What What's total rent now? all five units. Oh, Roughly. wow. Uh, that would take me a second. Give me, just give me a second here. It would be, uh, hey, 45, six, 82, 92, 93, 94, 50, 94, 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the debt service, um, on the front is about 1800 and that was with 5% down too. That was a $310,000 purchase price at 5%, um, bought down to to a three-ish and then the debt service uh on the back what it is about 2300 long-term fixed rate 30-year debt and that third unit i did pay all cash for and i think i built for about sixty-eight thousand. so i have some money don't let those numbers fool you like i have my time 30 years of expertise baked into those of sweat equity that i didn't pay for and then i also paid cash for the last standalone unit that that's a 1500 dollars a month product so don't, I, I don't want to oversell this like, oh, you can go do this in six months and you'll have 10 grand in your pocket. It's not easy, but it's repeatable. And I just want everybody to know that like, I, I mean, I, I did this in six months. If it took you five years and you did it twice, you're retired and a millionaire, you're done. Yeah. That's how obtainable it is. Like, yeah. just think long game. Like, don't judge, you know, your insides on everything else you're seeing just like come up with a plan it may not be this one but come up with a plan is all stuff super talks about um play the long game and you'll win it's just mm -hmm. the people that that don't win they just either give up or die yeah, all you gotta not do yeah stay alive and don't quit um yes. the other thing is <laughs> the other thing we're seeing is more and more focus i think gavin newsom again i love to give him grief um but i think he just signed a new a B thirteen thirty three or whatever it is, basically yeah. allowing you to sell, right? Do a lot split and sell the ADUs. Is that do I have that right? You have it very close to right. So SB nine has some language to allow for an actual fee simple lot split and sale. This new legislation that was just signed um, is about condo uh, oh. condoization. So it's not a lot split, but you can actually Got condo it. off that section and sell it. And that's Thatch's play. That's what Thatch yeah. is doing up in up in Seattle. 
Uh, that's a great strategy if you're in an area that's going to drive a really high purchase price. So I'll just give a couple examples in 60 seconds. So if I'm in Seattle, I buy a single family house for 500. I remodel it for 100. I'm in it for six. I put 300 into uh, an ADU. I'm in $900,000 into this area. But if I condo off that ADU and sell it, it'll sell for 750. Like that's insane to build an ADU for 300 and make $350,000 of, of kind of gross equity. You can't do that in most markets. So I just always warn people like that. That strategy is great if you're in a coastal market or a really high price market. I don't know where everybody on here is from, but again, we're just going to use Zuber's example of Fresno. If we're in Fresno, the, the price to rent is really high, but the price to build isn't as high. So we probably wouldn't want to condo that and sell it because we might, you know, we might be pretty close to one to one to getting our money right. back. If we're trying to build cash flow to get into like, you know, our first little piece of portfolio, we might consider it. But I always tell people to, um, I mean, my strategy and what I teach and what I share and what I do is build and hold because we're not trying to make quick checks. We're not trying to pay Uncle Sam lots of money. We're trying to mm -hmm. build needed workforce housing, hold it for a long time and let inflation make us wealthy. Yeah. It's, uh, inflation's a feature, not a bug. Might as well, might as well use it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, folks, it's time you can ask questions of Derek. I will just continue to go on myself if I, nobody raises their hand. So, but uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions. So um, go ahead and raise there your are hand. No there. stupid, no stupid questions either. Please do not be afraid. Like you guys are the cream of the crop to pay to have access to, to Zuber and his team. Like get your money's worth. Like literally ask me everything you can think of. There's no stupid questions. I'm not going to judge you. Like, don't be shy. Yes. Are you calling on people or? Yeah, I go, uh, I, okay. I see Karen's hands up. I mean, I can't unmute her. So maybe you can moderate. I think she's clapping. Karen, no, do you have a, oh, oh. I do oh, have a question. Awesome. So I have a 300 square foot shed um, that I, I use as a shed. Um, used to be my husband's workshop. Um, I'm thinking about turning it into an ADU. My, my only problem is it is at the, I'm on an acre. It's at the bottom of my property. So my property goes road to road. The bottom road is an HOA. Um, but really it's only an HOA for, to get together, to pay for the snow removal. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about contacting them and seeing is 300 square feet too small. Mm -hmm. And I did, or I already had a contractor come out and look at it and he's estimating anywhere, probably between 80,000, a hundred thousand to redo 300 square feet, which feels like a lot to me. Actually, yeah, great I question. Two contractors and they both kind of gave me that yeah. number. So let's let's go backwards um, and I'll go towards your first. So at the end there, it, it, we're less worried about what it costs and we're more worried about what it will produce. So there's a relativity factor there. It's going to cost a hundred grand. If it rents for, if it nets a thousand dollars or more a month, I'd say that's a go all day long. A 1% rule on a brand new unit in a great area out in the country. Um, from there, no, it's not too small. I would say 250 is about the smallest micro units I'm seeing, um, but there's usually not a, a, a stipulation in the code that says this ADU has to be at least 400 and no bigger than 800. So small is okay. A lot of people, um, I was just on the Berkeley ADU tour yesterday down in the Bay Area, and I one of the favorite units I went into was 300 square feet. It was awesome. I'm going to post a reel on it later today on my Instagram. You'll see it. But no, that's not. Uh, what what strikes me as kind of odd, and I, my hackles go up, is that you're on an acre that tells me you're probably in a little bit of a rural area and you might be on a septic tank. Uh, I am on a septic tank. So okay. I would not only have to put in the septic, but I would okay. also have to put in a driveway for them yeah. because otherwise they'd have part to of... walk up the hill and okay. the park is part... would be tight. Is that part of the hundred thousand to put in that driveway and the septic? Mm -mm. The septic? Yes. The driveway? Okay. No. Okay. That's good. That's good. Um, and so just to be clear, you know, my, my infrastructure, uh, checklist, like I, I don't buy any places that have well or septic for this strategy, um, because plug and play all these city codes and state laws are all about infilling the city limits. So if we're outside of the UGB, the urban growth boundary or the city limits, they're not as friendly. So you have an uphill battle. Like you literally are trying to take cars and sewer uphill, like pun intended, you have an uphill battle and it's an uphill battle because of regulation. Um, what state are you in? I'm in California. Okay. And have you talked to your planning and zoning office 
in your county because you're not in the city limits you're you're not in an incorporated municipality do i right? talk to them yes but that's because i'm redoing another house right now i have not okay. talked to them about this because i it was a project that i didn't even really want to consider until okay. after the other one's finished okay cool well we're going to pick on you is that okay that's fine okay we're going to use you as a great example of like how to do this so um, I like that you're already talking to them about something. Um, one thing, like this is the two buckets. One bucket is we're putting on ADU goggles and we're looking for properties that we know our strategy works. The other bucket is we have a property and we're going to try to adapt to the rules, which is way, way, way harder. But if we are, we always start with um, a phone call, an email, and if we can, a trip into the local planning and zoning office. Okay. Um, Hey, it's Karen. I live at 123 Adams Road. I've got this shed. It's built on a foundation. You'll probably find the permits from when it was built in the late 80s. I'm mm -hmm. really interested in add adding needed infill housing. I understand by looking at some of the, the, the county records of the county commissioner's meeting minutes that they want ADUs. How do I do this? Don't be afraid to ask the decision makers to help you. They, they sometimes will beat you up. Sometimes it's like, God damn, is this a DMV? Like what the hell? But they're paid on a tax basis to help you develop. So don't get don't don't be afraid to ask them. But I always say start there. So what you could potentially have done uh, is call them and they'd say yes, uh, it is allowable use, but you're going to need this special permit for the DEQ to tie into your septic, or you're going to need a new septic. Um, they're going to give you all the standards you have to meet, and you want to do that before you you spend any of your own valuable time meeting with contractors or having contractors come out and give you a bid and have them draw up preliminary plans. Like all that stuff is is null and void if you can't meet the standards. So always, always, always call email. And if you can go into the local planning and zoning office, get to know the decision makers by name and let them help you. My, oh. my secret weapon to doing that is, um, you know, Hey, you say, say Karen goes in, Hey, I've got this 300 square foot shed, all the stuff I already said, I want to build uh, an accessory dwelling unit. What would you do if this was your property? If you can empower the planners and the decision makers, and, and literally, this is not a, like a winning friends and influencing people tactic from Dale Carnegie. This is like the truth. Like, hey, you're the pro. You look at code and you look at uh, applications all day long. Like, I respect your authority. Like, how would you do this? Like, is there a, is there a path to a legal rental here? Mm -hmm. And you'd be amazed at how people will like soften up and truly help you when you ask for their help. It's hard to swallow our pride. I don't know what I'm doing. Please help me. What would you do? Can I ask one more question? You can ask all the questions you want. And if anybody doesn't get your questions answered today, you can always call me, email me, text me, whatever. Everybody is going to get their value. I promise. Okay. So yesterday I went with one of my, with one of my neighbors, one of my friends, and she and I went and looked at a property in Placerville. It's on seven acres. Mm -hmm. It has a um, very tiny house that was remodeled in the 1960s. So mm -hmm. quite old. Um, with, it says an ADU. Well, the ADU is attached to the garage. However, there's no way it's legal because I stood in the shower and I could barely even move in the shower. It was the smallest shower I've ever seen. Like something you'd see in a tiny, tiny old RV or something. Mm -hmm. Um, so she's considering that, but when I walked through it, I told her she was nuts, but I'm going back today so I can try to see it with her eyes. Uh, mm -hmm. because when I walked through, all I saw was money pit, money pit, money pit, um, needs a new deck. It's probably going to need the upgraded sewer lines. It's, it definitely needs upgraded electrical, the flooring, the kitchen, I mean, everything. So for her, she has a vision of that. And, um, because she, this is what she wants. She wants a small place for her to live and then something to rent. Um, but how does she know if it's going to cost more than what it's truly worth? Good question. Wonderful question. So at, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of unpack that from how you started to how you ended. The first question I'll directly answer is you don't think it's legal. Um, the, the codes for, for a shower are minimum five foot ceiling height. Uh, any thing within five feet has to be a tempered window that's below five feet off the floor. There's not really a, a shower size. So that alone does not tell me that that's an unpermitted bathroom, but okay. the easy, super simple way is to just, who am I going to call? If I have a question, the planning, the planning and zoning department, do we have a certificate of occupancy? This is, this is a, a house I'm looking to purchase before I, I spend a bunch of money and do a bunch of work and buy this 
this money pit. I want to know that this second unit, this ADU that's being advertised is a legal existing residential unit that has a certificate of occupancy, C of O, C of O, C of O, certificate of occupancy. You need record in hand, not like the planner on Friday on their way out the door says, oh yeah, if it says ADU, it's an ADU, buy it, buy. You need in hand, you need this that says certificate of occupancy at this address, this legal title. You need that. Or it's not legal and you can go negotiate really, really hard with your seller and and we're not going to threaten them and say, hey, you're misrepresenting this, but really that's what they're doing um, mm -hmm. because they don't know any better. So mm -hmm. I would look at that as far as costing, the best advice I can give you is to, to find a local contractor in that area um, that you know, like, or trust or somebody else know, likes, or trust and you check references on them and have them walk the property. There's no free lunch, folks. If you want to get a good person to come up and walk a property and give you a realistic timeline and a realistic price, offer to pay them. Mm -hmm. Hey, I know your time's valuable. You're busy. I'll, I'll pay you $500 to come up here and spend a couple hours walking through the property and give me like a legitimate estimate. Nobody else is doing that. They'll probably say, you know what? I'll, I'll, you don't even need to pay me. But the the fact that you're offering to pay them top dollar for their time is going to put you to the top of the list. They're also going to say, this is a client that I might potentially want to work with because they mm -hmm. value my time, right? Mm -hmm. You're you're just going to stand out in your market uh, if you do that. So I, I can't tell you if it's a good deal or if it needs too much work. Um, it doesn't even matter to me what the price is. What matters to me is is the zone that uh, is it zone for what I want to do, and can I get a builder up there that's going to give me a realistic kind of expectation of what it might cost? And then after all of that, and I look at the yield that it would make, or in her case, she wants to live in the little one and rent the other one to reduce the impact of her mortgage payment. Yeah. Then I would back that into the price. Okay. Yeah, great. Those are great questions, Karen. Like you're you're obviously like a front row student. Zuber, do we have a gold star we can give her? <laughs> I wish I did. Yes. Okay. I wish I did. I got to get some of those. One other question. Would you ever be worried about the asbestos on the older buildings? No, not at all. I'm not right. worried about it at all. I mean, we're either going to, we're either going to mediate it and build that into our, our price or we're going to just cover it up. Okay. Thank you. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Lead's the same. Like we're not, we're not worried about it. It's just, it's a, it's a puzzle piece. There's a reason why that's still on the market is because it's a hard one. When we solve hard problems, we get paid. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yep. Don't be afraid to negotiate. Uh, Jason, your hand was up next, I believe. Jason. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Hey, Derek. Hey, Appreciate the insight today. Um, all right. I have a few questions. Uh, I want to start off with like a three part question, more so about contractors. Um, how do you go about finding a good contractor or a team to build the ADU? What are the tells of a good contractor? And how do you know they're giving you a good price relative to the value they bring? Great questions. So uh, again, I'll go back to front. So how do I know they're giving me a good price relative to what I'm getting? Mm -hmm. I'm less worried about how much they're charging me. I'm way more worried about what it will produce. Like we need to just change our focus. Like we're so brainwashed into thinking like find good deals, go off market, build relationships with wholesalers, make disrespectful offers. Love you, Zuber. Um, all that <laughs> stuff's important. But at the end of the day, it's like, what will this produce and do I want to hold it long-term? Is it in line with my goals? Okay. My goals are long-term hold. So your goals might be different. It, is this, you know, going to be a good flip might be your question. Um, the contractor piece, this is, this is the most valuable thing I'm probably going to say today. So like take notes if you want, or just remember this almost a 30 year contractor on and off here. Like we suck. Like I suck at business. I suck at uh, accountability at, um, at organization, like contractors are good at building stuff. We're not good at business. So that's really what I like to tell people is you're going to find a really good business uh, man or woman or they contractor, or you're going to find uh, a really good actual in the field production person. They usually are not the same side of the brain. So it's not always the same person. If you're looking for a contractor, uh, this is what I would do to build your ADU. I would go to the local lumber yard. Okay. Mm. Closest to the actual geographic build site. So not the one that your uncle has been using two towns over. Like if you're looking for, um, you know, uh, to build an ADU on the North side of Fresno, I would go to the closest professional lumber yard. This is not Lowe's. This is not Home Depot. This is not Ace or Hubbard's. This is a privately owned lumber yard. That's where all the professionals hang out. That's where they all get their lumber. I would call email and go in. This is the same stuff I talk about for, for zoning. I like to go in and go up to the counter and I say, hey, who has been paying their bill here for 10 years or more? Who has integrity? And who would you hire to mm -hmm. build an ADU in your backyard? 
the the lumberyard is a very interesting um kind of ecosystem and people stay at lumberyards for a long time like 10 20 30 years like they start sleeping the floors then they're in sales and they do window orders and there's actually this like really good longevity curve on in that market so i i find nationwide that people have been there at these jobs for a long time and they know everybody in the industry they know the people to avoid they know the people they would like so that's my trick every time if i'm looking for just an electrician I'm not going to go to Lowe's. I'm not going to go to the electric aisle where the wire is. I'm going to go to the supply house. I'm going to go to the wholesale supply house where homeowners can't go, where all the electricians go. And I'm going to ask the counter the same thing. Who's been paying their bill here for 10 years or more? That's the most important thing. They have staying power. They have integrity in the market. They have experience. Um, same thing at the plumbing house. If I need just a plumber, I'm going to use the same principles. And then for all these, for the subs or the general, for your question, who do I pick to buy my, uh, build my ADU? I am going to find up to three of those. I like to find three and then I interview them myself. And this is the most important part of, of that secondary process is, can you give me a list of three clients that you've built ADUs for in the last year? Okay. If they don't have them, I'm going to keep looking. Okay. I want somebody who's done exactly what I want to do. We want to go to specialists. Okay, if you need, um, you know, to have a cavity done, you don't go to an orthopedic surgeon, you go to an oral surgeon or, or a dentist, right? We want to think the same way in business and building. So breaking that down real quick, um, go to the, the nearest lumberyard to the site. We're creatures of habit. We do not like to travel very far. Like we do not, like I won't, I haven't had a client in, in a lot of years, but um, back mm -hmm. in the day, like I wouldn't travel very far. All the builders that I know are good. They don't travel very far. They don't have to, the good ones don't. So the, the geographic location, um, going to that lumber yard, asking who has integrity and who they'd hire, and then interviewing them and asking them for references. And then when you get the references, call them. Sure. Anybody that's a good builder, they're going to love to give you references. Oh, I just finished an ADU down on 22nd Street for the Smiths. Here's their number. Call them. They're going to love to show you this. One thing I've learned about ADUs, it's it's kind of it's kind of weird, but it's like a baby. Like anybody that gets through this process, like it's their baby. They want to show it. And like I've seen people with, with their ADU as like the screensaver on their phone. Like they're proud of it. Like they want to share this process with others. Uh, another way is to just like go to meetups and, and get referrals. But I, I would only hire somebody that's built an ADU to build me an ADU. A custom home builder is going to be really close and they'll probably do a good job, but they don't know all the nuances with permitting the ADU and how to work in tight quarters. And we can't use trusses on this house because the crane won't get back there. We're going to have to stick frame the roof. There's all these weird little things. Um, but so many times and I'll end them with this here. So many times I see people that are about to embark on this 100, 200, $300,000 project. And they don't like, they don't interview the builders. They don't call the references. They call me six months into the project. And they're like, Derek, they ran off with half my money. I'm screwed. Project's halfway done. And I'm like, well, what did their references say? Did, did anybody else have this problem? They're like, well, I got busy and I didn't call the references. I liked them. They had a new truck. They had a pretty smile, like whatever, like a, we trusted them. Like, Trust, but verify. Yep. That's a good tip. I appreciate that. Uh, the next question is around, um, and I know this might be more of a relative question, but in your experience, what bed, bath uh, split or dimensions have really been like the ones that yield the most return for you? It's like a two bed, one bath, two, two. Yeah, good question for, for just an ADU. Yeah, just for ADU. That's right. Okay, one one period. Back to what Zuber was saying. Like, he, he buys a place in the historic district, and he wants a twelve hundred footer, and it's like, whoa, 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 no, don't buy in the historic district. We want a small one. Um, we want to we want to run our numbers on what works. So let's just say that I build an ADU for a hundred dollars a square foot, and it costs you two hundred dollars a square foot. Mm -hmm. And let's just say that that ADU is six hundred square feet, and it's one one. In Fresno, a brand new 600 square foot, one bedroom, one bath unit in a decent side of town is, let's just call it, for easy math, let's just call it $1,000 a month. It's going to net. Um, if we build a 1,200 square foot ADU that's 2-2, is that going to rent for 2,000? Probably not. And what I use for my, my gauge is I use the HUD area median rents. So I always look at every unit, like the chart I use is, is this going to be section eight? And if it's section eight, how much do they pay per bedroom? And there's a lot of data in there. I'm not saying it's perfect, but a one bedroom might rent for a thousand, a two bedroom might rent for 1225, a three bedroom might rent for 15. So if it's going to cost me twice as much to build a 1200 square footer as it is a 600 square footer, but I'm only getting 20% more rent for a hundred percent more price. Is that a good investment? 
not not for me. Sure. Um, there are cases where you know we're gonna move um, mom into the back house and she wants room for the grandkids. Or there's cases where this ADU code's awesome. Me and my wife are gonna move into the ADU and we're gonna rent the front house and we're gonna live for free and we're gonna travel. And our goals are to have room for people. So we might max it out. But if we're looking at this as investors through through our ADU goggles that we're trying to drive yield with, bigger isn't better. One bedroom, one bath is my go-to period. Um, I do have a two bedroom, two bath plan set that's 800 square feet. I just built that. And um, you can see all the stuff I'm building as much as, as well as how much I'm paying on my YouTube channel. I'm not trying to plug it here. It's all free. Like I'm not selling anything, uh, but I just did a two bedroom, two bath. And we're testing that one. Um, and it rents for 1850 and our one bedroom, one bath rents for 15. Mm. So it's, it's not as much of a return. I just did it more to like test the market. Does the yeah. two, two work as well? because um, it's more desirable. And then I'll just touch on it real quick on the conversion. If I'm looking for a house, uh, three, two minimum, and ideally I'd want a four, three. So, you know, that that unicorn that everybody, uh, the non-unicorn that everybody wants is a three, two. So if I have a four, three, and we're just going to peel off the master into a one, one, we still have a three, two in the main house. But that doesn't mean this doesn't work with a two, one, where you add a bathroom and turn it into a one, one duplex on both sides. You just have to like, be really clear on, on what you want and what you can afford. But those are great questions, Jason. I got one, Zuba, can I get one more off? And Absolutely. One more. Let's do it. Perfect. Okay. Um, so you, you touched on a bit here earlier, um, the rent for it, right? You said you start on the uh, to kind of figure out uh, how much you rent out for. Is, is, is there any other resources you use? Like, is it, is it, do you use like, apartment units as comps or houses? Is it rent more or less? Like what's, what's yeah. your thing for them? Yeah, good question. So my new standalone units are, are so amazing because they're like the comps are standalone custom houses or cottages. Another reason I like the, the standalone ADU and I'll touch on this real quick is it's a high demand, low supply product. It's a small custom house. Every one, one on the market, not everyone, especially in my market, if I have anything to do with it, because everybody's mm -hmm. going to be building these. Every one, one is an apartment. It's got a shared wall, you know, beside you, above you, below you, maybe all four of those. And this is a new standalone unit. So it's going to demand a premium, right? Because mm -hmm. you're getting privacy, location, and amenities. But what I do personally, um, and I've got a, a quick little YouTube video on this, is I go on to like Craigslist and Zillow and I go to filters and I filter my area and then I filter one bedroom, one bath, and then I hit go. And I look at everything on the market, 95 per percent of it is either an apartment or a duplex, triplex, quadplex. Very rarely will we see, you know, a detached multifamily unit or an ADU. And um, I just watch those. I mean, kind of what the Zuber teaches you guys again, like shout out to Zuber. If you're on this channel and you're in his course, you're winning. Um, but he teaches daily discipline, work on your buy box. Like I don't do that. Uh, I have a little bit different strategy, but I, I do the exact same principles on rentals. So every night obsessively, I like, I hate to admit this, this is like OCD. Um, <laughs> every night I look at rental units every night. Like I've done this for 10 years. Uh, I look at every rental in my market. So I'm just like so in tune to what stuff rents for, but set a criteria on Zillow and Craigslist and apartments.com plug in the one, one, and just every day, look at like what one ones are renting for and look at how long they sit on the market. You're like, Oh, one ones rent for 1800. And then every night when you look like four weeks later, you're like, that's still on the market. That's too high. The market will put downward pressure on that price. Mm -hmm. So that's how I, that's how I do it. Um, apartments aren't great comps, but if you can, if you can make it work with apartment numbers and you have mm -hmm. a better product because it only shares one sidewall and you soundproofed it and it's in a better neighborhood, you know that you're going to get at least that. Nice. Thank you so much. Yeah, Very Jason. Cool. Thank you for asking the questions. Very cool. Van Ruth, you're next. Hi, Derek. Um, my question is, um, is it worth um, it to uh, look at the unpermitted ADUs and then get them permitted? Or is that just not enough um, juice for the squeeze? Yes, that's a great strategy and a great question. Yes, as long as it's in an area that will allow ADUs by right or, or, or by permit. So if you're in California in a city limit and you know there's no easements or there's no this or that, yes. And this is the trick for, for attacking it. So you go under contract or you find a place and you, you negotiate a little bit of time, call your city. Uh, this is going to be planning and zoning. You're going to ask them, hey, I'm looking at 123 Adams Road. It has an illegal ADU. I just want to make sure that this illegal existing structure can meet the setbacks uh, can you just send me a list of um, conditions I'd have to meet to get this permitted? 
And then I would say, you know, Peggy, please pass me over one cubicle. And I'd talk to the building department and I would request, you got to pay for it. Almost every market I've ever worked in will let you do this. You request a paid special inspection from the building official while you're under contract. And you have the building official come out. Hopefully, if you're good, you're also going to be there with your contractor and your realtor. And you're going to walk through that property with a clipboard. And you're showing the soft underbelly of this property before you buy it. Don't be the person that calls me and says, Derek, I just bought a house with an ADU and the city just red tagged me because it's not an ADU. It wasn't permitted. Now I'm screwed. Don't be that person. Um, the special inspection, the, the inspector is going to go through and say, hey, you need you know, GFIs here. You need um, arc fault interrupters here. This egress window is too small. You're going to have to expand it to 5.7 square feet, whatever it is. These are just examples. Most, most contractors that have built ADUs in your area can do that without the inspector. Um, but if you walk into a place that's obviously unpermitted, the shower example that Karen used, like you can't even fit in it and like, you have to like snudge over to the bathroom and there's no windows in the bedroom, stuff like that, where you're like, this is not at all permitted. I can tell it still may be worth it, but you need to walk through with the building official on a special inspection and a contractor to figure out what it costs. Yes. The planning and zoning department says this illegal ADU can be permitted. The building department says, make these 10 corrections and we will permit it. And then you find out how much all that's going to cost. And you go back to the seller and you say, hey, this is a great spot. 300 sounds a little bit high because it's going to cost me $45,000 to make all these repairs. It's going to cost me three months of time. We'll give you 225 and we'll take this problem off your hands. And you won't even have to disclose to your next potential buyer that your listing is wrong and this isn't an ADU. So that's a great strategy. I mean, that's one of my favorites is, is to hunt for properties that have illegal ADUs in areas where I know ADUs are allowed. And then I go look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, this is an easy fix. We're just going to put some more insulation in the attic, change out the panel and like, it'll be done. Okay. Um, I, my second question is, do you, uh, I know my city has uh, pre-approved plans. Are they worth it to do or are they, is it better to get custom plans? It depends on your goals. Pre-approved plans are great. I love them personally. Uh, they're they're not perfect. You know, we it took us almost two years to give our city the the two sets of plans that you find on my website under the resources tab. We gave our city, and we built them several times in our city. They'd already permitted them several times in our city, and it still took two years for the city to be like, "Yes, these are pre-approved." It's like, well, no shit. Like you guys have already seen these a bunch of times. Um, so they do work. The, the benefit is you save some time, you know, one to three months because it doesn't have to go through building review. You still have to go through planning review, which is like plot it on your map to make sure you meet the setbacks to make sure you you're not over max building coverage, you know, to make sure that you have stormwater management or whatever you need in your area. Uh, but they are cool because they're pre-approved. A lot of times in your market, you might be able to find a builder that's already built that exact unit. Yep. So just think of like, you know, tying our shoe or washing our car or getting really good at your job. The first time you did it, you were really slow. You got it done. But like, you know, think of how much faster you tie your shoes now than when you were three. Same rules apply in construction. People are practicing. They've done this unit a couple of times. They can probably give you a pretty good price. They probably already have a cut list. There's some efficiencies that the builders have built in where they'll make a little more profit, but they also might be able to give you a better deal. If you're not picky about the design, and it fits that buildable footprint fits in your backyard. I would always say start with pre-approved plans. Start there. Yes, that's a great question. Always start there. The inspectors are used to looking at them. They'll literally get out of their truck and she might just walk through and like sign something because they're used to seeing it. There's no surprises. Um, the way I haven't gotten enough affordability on, on attached or standalones, but the way we save money and drive yield is by having a super simple design. So I would not take a pre-approved plan set. A lot of these, like the local architect that's like at the end of their career and their legacy is to like give some custom plans to the city. Just make sure they're easy to build. Like I, I look for rectangles. We, we want a single rectangular footprint and we want either a single gable roof or a shed roof. We don't want extravagant things. Every corner that you deviate from a rectangle or a square, you're adding five to $10,000. So um, just because they're pre-approved plans doesn't mean they're going to be affordable. So is, if they're pre-approved and it's a simple design and there's people in your area that's built them, they might even have already been comped if they're already built. That's another good thing. If you're going to burn your money back out, it's like, go see if, if you can get that comp. Um, and then a lot of times too, last thing on this topic, ask the city, hey, have you given these out to many people? It's all public record. Can I go look at past plans and then just figure out who's already built it and go knock on their door? Or go drive by it. If there's a dumpster out front and there's a construction crew, just go go look at it. See if it looks like something you'd want in person. 
but yes, always consider uh, pre-approved plans. Great question. Um, one more before I get to the back of the queue. Um, mm-hmm. So for um, financing, how, how do you normally go about that? Um, I uh, And is it worth it to use like a self-directed IRA for somebody else's um, ADU and then kind of use that as a leverage? Yes, good question. So it's going to depend on your goals and your market. But if the if the actual overall investment makes sense, get the money any way you can. It's usually a combination of some kind of financial stack that involves your savings, borrowing from your own investor sponsored plan, potentially calling somebody in your family that's, that would be private money, maybe calling hard money. Uh, I don't like hard money. I like fixed variables. Um, home equity is a great one. Like the, the the hard ones are somebody that just bought a house last year and they have no equity and their DTI is maxed. It's like, you might have to go earn more money and save your money. This is not a get rich quick scheme. You have to like have fundamentals of like earning and saving money and having decent credit. There's a product out there that I, I like. I'm not sponsored by them. They're trying to like give me some kind of affiliate. I haven't done it yet, but they have a decent product. Um, Renify, I've got a link I can send people if you want to email me, but Renify has a 20 year fixed rate second that will give you 90% LTV on your current property or 125% LTV on your unbuilt plans. Um, They're a lot better than a construction loan because their draw system is better. They're not perfect, um, but I'm seeing people get 70, 60 to 70% of their build costs with Renify. So in other words, I've got a house, I've got very little equity, but I'm going to build a hundred thousand dollar ADU. They may be able to get you second position financing either interest only or fixed rate 20 year um, for, you know, 50, 60, 70% of that sometimes. And the nice thing about that is you don't have to touch your first. And if you've, you know, purchased, if you've owned a house for any more than three years and you weren't asleep, you should be, you know, well under four, hopefully under three. So you don't have to touch that. You don't have to upset the apple cart and refi your, your note and your ADU bill at eight and a half. Um, so that's a good way. Another thing to do is you can partner with people. Um, if you go to, you know, somebody in your family has money and it's parked in the bank making five and a half percent on a T-bill and you're like, hey, look, I'm going to build this ADU. I already have a builder. We have pre-approved plans. I've interviewed them. I'd like to bring you in. Uh, this is a 1.5% deal all day long. Would you partner with me? Uh, but yeah, money from your IRA to your direct question. Yes, I would. I mean, I've got money from my fire department days parked in VTSAX. And over time with reinvested dividends, it should be seven to nine percent. I mean, I can make 50, 60, 70, 80 percent uh on my money in an ADU. So all day long. I mean, if you were, you know, only a quarter of that, you're still doubling the rate of return you have. Check with your employer sponsored plans. A lot of them will let you borrow 50% up to fifty thousand dollars. So just because you have, you know, a 401k or 457 or 403b with 200 grand in it doesn't mean you can suck all that out uh without without tax and penalty, of course. But yes, look at any option you can to get the money if the investment is better than other investments the money's in. You know, Dan Bird might tell you something different. He (laughs) might say, uh, you know, if you're coming to Vegas, ask him that question. I get that a lot. Derek, I have a hundred grand. Do I build an ADU or do I buy Apple stock? And it's like, well, what are your goals? Can you be a, can you manage a property? Can you put in some sweat equity? I mean, one might not always work for the other. Thank you. Very cool. Richard, you're next. Richard. Hi, cheers. Good morning. So my question is sort of piggybacked onto that one with the partnership. So I have a a, a, a pretty good friend. Um, his parents are way older um, and they're going to finish out their time in their current house, which they bought in the 70s for, you know, 80 grand. It's on probably an acre and a half lot. Um, so he kind of wanted to partner up you know, kind of I supply more of the money and help with the planning, you know, when the parents um, don't need the house anymore, we sort of renovate it and maybe put another, you know, house on the same lot or something like that. So how do you, how would you approach partnerships in that type of situation? Would you just try and buy the person out and then just run with it or actually, you know, do some sort of arrangement where you split profits or how how do you approach that type of thing? Yeah. Good question. What, what state are you in Richard? 
Georgia. Georgia. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good question. And I, I'm not a, a pro at structuring partnerships. I want to just be forthcoming there. Like I'm really good at one thing that's not in my wheelhouse, but what I will tell you briefly is if based on what you said, if you're the money and you're looking to partner in an investment, I wouldn't do that with anybody that hasn't done lots of these. So I wouldn't just partner with your buddy because he happens to have the dirt. I would partner with a developer that's done it lots of times. So you're protected. Um, if you were in California and you had the same question, I would say, use this new condo law, hire a condo attorney, and you could just buy part of the, the land. You wouldn't have to partner. You could, you could buy the backyard of grandma and grandpa. That's going to fund their in-home care that they need until they die. And you don't have a partnership. You, you're able to partner financially, but you have your own separate dirt that you're titled and deeded to. Um, so those are kind of the things that I would, I, I would say, but if you're looking to park your money in, in this type of asset class, I would find somebody, um, that's done it, done it more. And if it's your friend, that's like, Hey, I want to do this. And he's, he wants to bring you in cause you're the money and he's, he's the work. I wouldn't, um, I would look at maybe for the first partnership, just doing debt, not equity. So, Hey, I'll fund this whole deal at X percent and you have 10 years to pay me back as opposed to getting into a partnership with your friend and your friend's parents, when there's probably already a trust and an estate and all this other stuff, it just gets complicated and gets expensive. And you might spend, you know, a, a 25% of the build budget on a, a lawyer contract that you guys still can't agree on. Yeah. When I look at, when I look at partnership, I really do. Olivia and I only do debt. We don't, um, we don't have JVs and what, because I want recourse, right. I want to be able to foreclose and, and you know, that's, that's what are really what I'm lending on. Uh, is the unit. So be careful. Yeah. Great question, Richard. The fact that you're like willing to like do creative stuff with your friend, like tells me you're going to win. Like you're going to mm -hmm. win. Just make sure you like you play the right game. Awesome. I mean, Thank everybody you. that's here, everybody that's on this call, like you guys are all way ahead of your peers. I mean, to, to be taking the initiative to be here today, I can already tell that. Thanks, Richard. Do you have a follow-up question? No, no, that's good. Oh, actually, I feel so kind of. So the other one is a, a similar deal. So I was looking in South Georgia, um, specifically doing Section 8. Um, I have family members down in South Georgia. One of them's a general contractor and sort of same situation. Um, he doesn't have any money, but he can do, you know, paint, drywall, you know, the basic stuff that I would need. And I also was probably maybe looking for him to be property manager. So my thought was, you know, give him, you know, 10% equity um, in the deal. And, you know, he kind of discounts his work. And do you guys think that would be kind of a good idea? Yeah. yeah. What What do you do for a living, Richard? I'm in IT. I'm a network security engineer. So kind of firewall okay. stuff. Okay. And you have, you have, a good, you have a good financial foundation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could you pretty... could you could you afford to lose the money that you're partnering with your your family member down there on? I do. Yeah. I mean, I could. I, obviously, I wouldn't want to. No. Okay. Well, if, if you can yeah. if you can afford to lose it and you want to get into real estate more passively, like that might work for you. I mean, it really might. Like, I, I don't know I, your exact situation. I'd actually I'd probably attack that situation differently, Richard. What I mm -hmm. I would probably paint a vision where. He could eventually get equity, but you want to you want to try this out for a year and you'll pay him above market rate, call it 10 percent, 12 percent, whatever it is. Because I've seen a lot of friendships and family relationships destroyed when money's involved because, you know, so and so's got it. So and so doesn't. So and so needs it's just it's messy. Um, I would not lean. I would not lead by offering equity because that can become a big problem that. I don't, that, that, that does not feel good to me. Cool. Perfect. All right. That's, that's what I needed. Thanks guys. Awesome. Jesse Thomas. Uh, hey Derek, uh, wondering if you've, uh, considered converting shipping containers as ADUs. I have uh, a shipping container on my property right now. And, uh, right now it's just used as storage thinking about, uh, dragging that back to the back part of the lot where there's, you know, in this particular part of the, um, state, there's zero lot lines allowed um, for replacement. So I was wondering if you've tried that, uh, uh, you've considered it, if not, and, and uh, any complications you've come across based on that. 
Yeah, yeah, good approach. question. I'm surprised we're an hour 23 in and nobody's asked about a boxable or a container house or a $40,000 ADU from Home Depot or a house that I can buy on Amazon. Here's the problem with all those. Uh, directly, no, I, I don't I don't touch those things. Um, not that I don't think they're cool or a good idea or eventually they may work, but the planning and zoning and building department is so archaic. Um, it moves really slow. The International Code Council uh, is a, a portion of that is adopted for your state code, whatever state you live in. And it's going to require that a dwelling is bolted down to a concrete perimeter. There are a few exceptions if it's a HUD stamped manufactured home. So we have all of these companies that are really trying to reinvent like the Clayton home that, that Warren Buffett owns, like a manufactured mm -hmm. home that has a federal HUD stamp. Mm -hmm. And the, the truth is um, due to regulations, no, it's not efficient. Like if you are in Alaska and there's no zoning regulations and you have an RV park and you already have, you know, sewer dumps and water and power, and you need to bring in a hundred pieces of refugee housing, something like this might work. But the bottom line is most jurisdictions will not allow this. Uh, you can retrofit a container to make it a legal dwelling and you can put it down on a, a pad, but most of the expense is in the planning and zoning and bringing water, sewer, pass and gas, um, cable, whatever out to your site and doing all the site work, you're going to need that to legally do a dwelling for anything. So why would we put a $3,000 rusty um, 22 gauge metal container down on that and then have to go inside and build it out of two by six and insulate it and, and, and do all the work? You're basically doing, you're building a small, simple design inside an airtight metal box and you're fighting the planning and zoning and building department the whole time. So I've seen people do it. A friend of mine has two container house ADUs up in Portland, Oregon that are legally permitted that have accessory dwelling unit certificate of occupancies. Uh, and he spent like 260,000. He could have built similar rectangular shapes and then sided them with corrugated metal to get the same facade and put like the corner bulkheads on for half the price. So the answer is yes, it's possible. But if you don't want to take my word for it and you want to, and not in a negative way, like I would suggest this is a great exercise. I would, I would call the planning and zoning department and I would say, Hey, I've got this 20 foot shipping container. I know it's going to be hard, but can you send me the regulations that I would have to meet to convert this into legal living space on this lot? If you're just getting started and you're like, Hey, I've got a septic dump right there. I'm going to just like do this under the table and rent it to my buddy. Like that's different. Um, but online, I'm always going to tell people to get permits and follow the rules. And although you can do it with a container, it's so expensive. I mean, it's the same reason why boxables aren't popping up because cities aren't permitting these, like they're not getting delivered. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll, I'll veer off real quickly. There's some decent pre-manufactured companies that we're seeing a lot of like clickbait marketing on. Uh, if you see something that's in your area, there's a couple of them in central California that are doing Okay. Uh, I just suggest that you call the company and say, hey, can you send me a set of plans? I want to send them to my local planning and zoning department to see what I would need to do to get these permitted. And then also I would go to their like Google review site and read real reviews from real people. A lot of these, you look at their marketing, and you're like, God, they must have sold thousands of units. And then you go read their reviews and they've got 30 reviews. They've got 20 deliveries and 19 of the reviews are awful. They're like, the unit is nice, but it's been here for six months. It's still locked. We can't get a permit. There's a red tag on it. Nobody at the, at the place will call me back. You know, these companies are using third-party contractors to do all the site work. My backyard is torn up. My sprinklers are broken. Just do your own research. Nobody's perfected this yet. Somebody will. Eventually, there's going to be a company that in X market um, does really well. The reason why nobody can perfect this is because every city uh, that you go to is going to have different requirements. You can't just get a rinse and repeat model that works in Fresno and go do it in Visalia. If it works in Visalia, that doesn't mean it's going to work in Bakersfield. So you can't scale because everywhere you go, you have to reinvent the wheel with like a new DMV person at the window. So it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not to be a dream killer, but it's just really, it's really <laughs> hard to do that. I would say um, build a 10 by 30 rectangular structure out of wood and put like a 412 shed roof on it and insulate it and build it to, you know, international building code. It's going to be cheaper, easier, and you're going to get the same thing. Right on. Okay. Thanks, Dirk. You're welcome. All right. Let's, uh, let's go to two people that haven't asked and then we'll go back to Jason and Van Reith after that. Uh, Senya, I think you're up next. Um, hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm having issues with my camera today. It's okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, Derek, uh, first of all, thank you so much for sharing all this valuable information. Um, definitely eye-opening. 
Um, we did mention um, verifying references for contractors. Um, so my question is, how do you verify references? Like for instance, um, like how do you know that the reference a con the contractor gives you is an actual former client and not just a buddy that provides these awesome like feedbacks? Like how do you know? <laughs> Yeah, wonderful question. It's because I'm going to ask them directly for the name and number of the past client, and then I'm going to call the client, and I'm going to ask them a few questions, and I'm going to ask them to come over and see their ADU. And like I said, um, clients that that work with contractors that have good experiences, they love to show off their work. And, and ADU is, is this thing, again, it's kind of like a baby in some cases. They, they can't wait to show you. I've yet to meet somebody that's gone through this process that didn't want to show up and tell everybody how they did it. Mm -hmm. So I would directly ask them for references. And if they give you three references for ADUs that they've worked on or built in the last year, maybe that you have to go back 18 months. And maybe one of the three is like, Hey, I'm really sorry. Like we, we have grandpa back there and he's, he's immunocompromised and we don't want to get him sick. We'd rather you not come over. Um, but they were awesome. This is our address. Just go ahead and do a drive by. It's, it's the little blue house in the back. You can't miss it. We love the builder. You know, they, you want real feedback. Like, you know what? There was a couple of times where we went over budget and he was able to, or she was able to, or they were able to explain why we went over budget. And, you know, there was a couple of times where it got tense, but they had good communication skills and we ironed it out. And in the end, we were really happy with them. It wasn't perfect, but there was a lot of change orders on our part. And you know, you want honest feedback. If somebody's like, no, you can't come by it. And yes, they're awesome. And I've used them a hundred times and they hang up. Like maybe that is their buddy, but just use mm -hmm. your best. I mean, if you're here, you're smart. Use your best judgment. Maybe all three of the references they give you won't let you come over and like walk through the unit, but I promise you one of them, one of the three will. Okay. So we, have multiple, we, have, we have multiple legs of the stool. So we go to the lumber yard. They, they already have integrity of paying their bill for a long time. The person that's been there working there for a long time likes them because they're a good person and knows their reputation. People don't give bad reputation, uh, at, you know, referrals. Like if somebody's a, a slug, they're not going to refer them. And then you also have the client and then you have your own visual. So between um, you know all those uh, those strategies, you're you're gonna be able to narrow down the good. The cream rises to the top. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Very cool, uh, Amy. I believe you're next. Hi, Derek. Um, thank you for coming on today to share your knowledge. Um, I really appreciate that. So my question go back goes back. Uh, in unit conversion where um, like you're trying to convert an existing space in the main house. So um, like, you know how you first thing is you look at the master bedroom, see if there's a bathroom. So what, like how big does the master bedroom have to be that's ideal for you? If it's like, like, yeah, just how big is that room typically ideally? that you would want it to be and then also do you try to like expand the footprint by like extending the building out or do you try to find existing space within I don't know like maybe it's next to a, a dining room or something and you push it out um, just like how do you make sure that whatever space you're converting is like a, a nice space that someone will want to live in and not just like you know like a single room kind of space but it has kitchen and bathroom but and it's really crammed in yeah yeah good question so if we're if we're looking for this with our adu goggles on and we haven't purchased it yet we can be way more picky if we have a house that has a 200 square foot master and there's no walk-in closet we're stuck we're either going to have to pop out or we're going to have to carve out some more of the interior my rule of thumb is like 250 300 feet think of all the really nice hotel suites you've stayed in that were like 200 square feet and work perfect they have a little tiny kitchenette they've got a bathroom and they've got an open area um, personally, my stuff that I'm doing is, is like four to four to 700 square feet. But if there was a great house in a great area and the master bedroom was only 200 square feet and there was a little, you know, say a 50 square foot walk-in closet, I might knock down those closet walls, um, to get a little bit more space in the studio. And then I would put up like a, an armoire or a wall cabinet for the closet to get a little bit more room, but it's always going to depend on your budget. Like if, if you're the shoelace investor that's trying to get their first place and you're like, Oh man, it's only 220 square feet and it's only one room and it's kind of small and there's only an eight foot ceiling. Do the math. Does it work? This is not our forever home. You can always convert it back. Can you afford to get on the property ladder, take action, 
do it. There's not like a right or a wrong way. Obviously, like if we walk into a master bedroom and it's 400 square feet and I see a lot of walk-in closets in the 90s that are way too big, that, that should be a bedroom. Mm -hmm. So get creative, but it's all based on your budget. Like if if you're really, really, um, you know, at, at the end of your financial means to close this place, you might have to make do with a smaller space that wouldn't potentially fit my my build box. Okay. There's, not a wrong, there's not a wrong answer. And if you if you get, do you own a home? Or are you looking for one? Um, looking for one. Okay. If you find something that you think is close, call me personally and walk me through it and I'll tell you what I would do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then just a follow-up question for these kind of conversion spaces, would it typically like almost a hundred percent be like a studio layout versus like, oh, it's big enough where it would have like a living room and a wall between with the, the room and the AEU? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I like to have a bedroom period. Uh, the the marketability of a bedroom is so big, like tenants want to be able to close off. I do a double pocket door. So there's a six foot opening. So it always kind of looks like a studio. But if there's guests over, the tenant can close the two doors. And they don't feel like their friends are sitting down in their bedroom. To do okay. the the bedroom, the one one, I'd say three to 400 square feet. You know, I, I've done it on lots of 400 square footers, 300 square feet is pushing it. Anything under 300 square feet, you don't want a room. It's just going to close it all down way too much. You don't want that. I don't know if I can share my screen. Um, I've got a picture. I, I will give you the ability to do that. Now you like, can. Yeah, I've kind of like my, um, let's see if I can pull it up here. Thought I had it. Can you guys see my, my screen <clears throat> here? Not yet. Okay. Can you see that? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's it's worth it. Just give me a second here. Screen share. <laughs> okay. What are you trying to pull up, young man? Uh, there we, we go. go. I think there we got it. Yeah. Let me get into here. And um, I was just going to show some pictures mm -hmm. of an actual uh, unit here. So this is kind of like basically what we do. If you can imagine, um, do, does everybody see this? This is the house, the example I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So this is a yeah. big house. This is a 2,400 square foot house. And this is the section on the left. This is a vaulted ceiling. It's 16 feet tall in there. It's basically like 16 by 30 ish. And right underneath the hose is where the sewer goes into the house. Right underneath the hose is where the water goes into the house. And I, I opened the front door and I looked over to the left after I did my 360. And that's when I knew I'll take it. Like it was a done deal. It was that simple. And then when we go inside the, the structure, um, what we're trying to do is uh, find a spot that's big enough to put a bedroom while keeping a one wall, what I would call a galley kitchen. And this is a good example of that. So we only need about 10 linear feet to put in a small kitchen or kitchenette. And then... Um, we have a double pocket door here to the left that goes into the bedroom. The bedroom, small size we're going to do is like 10 by 10. And then we have a little closet. So I'm always looking for an area that's 10 feet or more for this simple one wall kitchen. And then I'm always looking for a bedroom section that's 10 by 10. So if you, if you think about it, I mean, really 10 by 20 is doable. A 200 square mm. foot micro apartment. This one, um, I, I always put a loft in. I'm always looking for vaulted ceilings because anytime we have a loft, we get free space. So there's a couple hundred square feet up onto this loft area for storage. Anytime we frame in a bedroom or a bathroom, we do a loft above it if there's headroom. So those are kind of just a couple of basic pictures that I wanted to show of kind of the simplicity of that. Uh, if I'm able to, um, let me just see if I can drop back into... Uh, can you talk for a second, Zuber? <laughs> I could, I could certainly do that. Yeah. So one of the things There's you a, can see, oh, go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to say that was just a, the small bathroom. This is the small closet that we would put. This is the actual unit that I was talking about. Um, a, a tiny closet. You don't need much. 24 inches deep by six feet wide. We split it in half so you can put dresses in one side and double shelf and pull on the other. Most units get a washer and dryer in this closet. This one was so small. This is like the only unit we have that we didn't do a washer and dryer because it was just taking up too much space. Mm. Um, design principles that I'll talk about. We designed these little rooms, this closet. The other side of that closet is the kitchen of the of the main house. So we mm. wouldn't have wanted to put the closet on the other side and the head of the bed on that shared wall. We want to use design to reduce sound. So we're going to be filling that up with clothes. And then the other wall that shared the entry with the main house was the um, was the kitchen. So use good design to be able to, to minimize sound. And then really quickly for sound, we use two layers of five eighths drywall. It's super cheap. It's like $15 a sheet. And then we put green glue, which is a soundproofing proprietary compound between the two. Uh, and just a few other little pictures I'll just click through. This is our basic bathroom. It's five by eight. And with a five by eight bathroom, you can get a 30 inch tub shower surround, 30 inch minimum opening for a toilet, and then a 24 inch vanity. This one, this was before we put the, the medicine cabinet in and we were fully done, but you can just see it's very basic, very simple. And that's how we keep it affordable. That doesn't mean we can't use nice finishes. So when we're doing these really affordable space conversions, we use real hardwood floor. This is like, you know, Douglas fir floor and real slate tile. It's expensive products, but when you're only doing such a small area, it doesn't it doesn't cost that much to use nice finishes. People don't really care as much how big it is if it's a single you know renter. They just want something that's that's nice and in a good area. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. that's the basic that's our basic uh, interior conversion. Again, this is really small. It doesn't have to be a huge space. And one thing I didn't touch on that I'll I'll mention quickly is if you don't have ADU code in your area. You can still legally do every single thing you see here, except for this. If you're in the county or you're in a city where they don't allow ADUs because it hasn't gotten there yet, you can just do a pull up a building permit to add a bathroom. And as long as you don't put in a stove, uh, 220 volts or a um, gas line, it's not going to qualify as a dwelling. So we do these as well that don't have the stove. Mm-hmm. So okay. you can build an, I call it the stealth ADU. It's an ADU that's not an ADU, but it's still legally permitted. And then you mm -hmm. get a roommate under a master lease. So this strategy works for everybody. I always start with the zoning because we like to do the full kitchen. But the truth of the matter is most of our tenants are teachers and nurses, and they don't cook a 20 pound turkey. They don't need a full mm -hmm. range. We can do a 110 volt plug-in countertop appliance. I use these two burner induction cooktops. They're awesome. And the city can't tell you no. So you can do the kitchenette model without the ADU. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Derek. Um, oh, curious if this one didn't have a um, washer dryer, does it, do they just share the one um, with the master? I mean, the main house basically. No, good question. Out of all of our units, this is maybe one of three, I guess it's not the only one. It's one of a very few that doesn't have a washer and dryer. And that's just clearly disclosed up front that there's no washer and dryer on site. What I have seen in the past is that, you know, the neighbors, th this was the, the door that we punched in. This used to just be siding. This is the access that we put into that new unit um, just to kind of give people an example. Like the entry can be right next to each other. It doesn't have to be down the side. It doesn't have to be extravagant. In our area, the ADU code says the entry door can't face the same direction as the main house door. So I couldn't have put it out here on this wall, but it fit right here. It doesn't face the same direction. It faces 90 degrees. So just little gray areas where we get good um at at doing this mm -hmm. okay um last question um so for i know your market is in um oregon but in california and like today's pricing how much do you think it would cost to convert a space like that like if you had a guess yeah that's a good question i would say um under 100k uh, i did this for 28.5 um but in our area, like 6,000 of that was the impact fees, the system development fees, the permit, like the one-time pay-to-play fees. If you're in California and it's under um, uh, 499, you don't have to pay any fees. And if it's under 750, you have to pay very little fees. So that's another huge reason in California to keep them smaller. Mm. Um, that, that's all I was going to share. Thanks uh, for, for letting me put that up there. Okay. I yeah. That, I hope that helped. Just, it doesn't have to be a big space to fit in a bedroom. 
And uh -huh. I think you gave you gave me that video, right, Derek? So it's actually on my YouTube channel. Yeah. Under uh, yeah. walk walkthrough. So you could see the full video of that property. Okay. Yeah, that's, I'll definitely that's basically that's what we do every time. And uh -huh. um all the the every single product that we use, we give away on our website. We've got a PDF of the the lights that we use, the doorknobs, the drawer pulls, the appliances. So every mm -hmm. unit that we do, it, it may be different um, if it's an attached because we can't always control the square footage, but all of our detached units are the same. We literally just change the color. The, the point is that if you get something that works, uh, you can keep yield going up by reducing time and energy and, and decision fatigue by just keep repeating them. So I always say, if you've seen one of my units, you've seen them all. They, they <laughs> all use the same countertops, the same floors, the same tile, the same fixtures, appliances, everything. Okay. Thank you, Derek. I'll definitely um, reach out to you if I see a potential listing that I'm interested in looking into more. Yeah, for sure. I share, so I give free consultations for first time buyers. Um, so that's like, I'm not trying to sell you anything or like get you to like join my course. Like I will personally help you. I'll answer my phone and be like, Hey, look for this, this, and this. And anybody that's on Zuber's um, boot camp here, uh, feel free to reach out to me direct. Like a friend of Zuber is a friend of mine. You'll get hmm. special treatment. Nice. Thank you. Very cool. Jason, back to you, buddy. Appreciate it. All right. Uh, two questions. One kind of piggybacking off of the cost of the ADUs and the other one will be about contractors. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we talked about like detached garage or detached units, detached garage conversions, all that. I wanted to know if you can give like standard or like, I guess like your price point on how much one would, could expect to pay on a detached uh, ADU ground up versus a conversion and so yeah. on and so forth. What market are you in, Jason? I'm in uh, Southern California. Okay. Um, $300 a square foot is where it's going to absolutely start in, in Southern Cal. Uh, well, if you're hands off, okay. Mm -hmm. If yep. you're going to self-manage the project, you can probably save 20 to 40%. Um, I'm saying in my area right now, about 225, $250 a square foot hands off is where they're going to start. But this is the most important part of that number is that is only, and I repeat only when you follow the checklist we talked about. Okay. A lot of times I see people that have a similar budget, but they didn't put on their ADU goggles. They didn't confirm that the sewer line is new and it's plastic and they scoped it and there's no bellies or root intrusion. So they don't have to replace the sewer line. So many people, they go buy this house that was built in the thirties because they got a good deal and they go try to build an ADU for $250 a square foot. And they need to spend $50,000 before they even stick a shovel in the ground to replace the water line, to replace the sewer line and to upgrade the electrical panel to have enough power to actually run energy to this unit. So these prices are only if you buy the right properties that are flat. So you don't have thousands of dollars of extra dirt work. You don't have another $3,000 for a geo engineer. You don't have to engineer your foundation. You can just use the basic foundation details that came in your free pre-approved plans. So looking for flat lots, good infrastructure, good water sewer, um, good power, good access. I mean, if it's up on a hillside, 20 feet behind your house and there's only a three foot walkway on each side. Do you think the builder is going to charge you more than if it was on a corner lot and they could just back the lumber truck up and drop everything off. They don't have to pay extra for the cement pump to pump cement 200 feet up a pipe. You know, it's, it's starting in the right spot to get these prices. I was again uh, on the ADU tour yesterday in Berkeley, California, and we saw ADUs that were uh, $200 a square foot owner build. And there was one ADU on the tour that was $1,000 a square foot. And this is in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but the, their goal was not to drive yield. Their goal was to like have this, you know, jewel box that they could show all their affluent friends that came over. So depending on your goals, but as investors trying to drive yield, we can start at 250 a square foot. Okay. And is that whether it's a conversion or build ground up? That's still just kind of nope, standard. Nope. Ground up is, is, um, is that price and the conversions are half. So if you're in Southern Cal and you get three bids and they're anywhere from three to $500 a square foot, let's just call it, it's going to cost you $400 a square foot at that location for that unit. You can always cut that in half for a really good starting point for a conversion. If I have to convert a garage and the sewer line is on the other side of the house, you know, it's going to be the high end of half that price. If I'm converting a master bedroom and all I have to do is block off a doorway, uh, like I did on that one I showed you, put in an exterior entrance and put in a mini split HVAC system and pay some fees, it's really cheap. 
Like the only real expense there was the fees, the appliances and putting in that bathroom. Everything else was done. Nice. That's way easier of a conversion. Um, but that one still, you know, that, that cost us, um, you know, about $60 a square foot. Gotcha. So I'm building new standalone ADUs in Southern Oregon right now for a hundred dollars a square foot. Conversions are about 50, but tons of sweat equity. Like I just closed in the beginning. If you're hands off, depending on your market, 250 and 125 are the numbers I use. That's where they absolutely start. They only go up from there. That's like the cheapest you're going to do it. If you're hands off gotcha. Southern California, you know, add 30%. Okay, no, perfect. And then um, the other question is around um, managing the relationship with contractors, right? So how do you go about like setting expectations or do you just kind of let them lead and then you hold them accountable to it? Like, what would you suggest about working with contractors? Wonderful question. Um, I I'm going to let the last 10 years do most of that decision making for me. If they came highly recommended and they have good references, they're they're going to hold my hand. It's not the opposite way. Okay. Us as the investor, like we're, we're not running the show. We're looking for a, a professional that's going to like bring us along the way. Like we get that confused a lot. Um, yep. So I would be looking for somebody that's going to mentor you, not the opposite way around. And that's always going to start with the good references. The lumberyard loves this guy or girl. Uh, the people that they said, Hey, go look at these ADUs, love them and said they took good care of them. They're going to take good care of you. Basic human communication skills, like be clear, be concise, be able to make a decision. What contractors hate is meeting with homeowners over and over again to make decisions, like get everything that you can get as detailed as you can on your scope of work. It's a lot easier to do that on a new build because there's no variables where I see people get hung up is when you're like doing a remodel project and they, it's like, you got your scope of work perfectly. We're putting in a new kitchen. It's this many linear feet. And then while they're doing that, they accidentally cut a pipe with the sawzall. When they pull the drywall off to fix it, they find dry rot. And they're like calling you saying, hey, we should probably just replace this whole wall while it's open. And there's termites, by the way. What do we do? Mm -hmm. If you already have all that stuff, uh, if this, then that. Like if the more detailed you can get in your contract, the better. But at the end of the day, it's a relationship business. It's a trust business and you're going to have to hire somebody you like. So when stuff gets hard and it's always going to get hard, you can trust them. Because if you can't trust them and you have to be on site, always making the decisions, then you should be the general contractor and save 40% and not even pay them. Right. So it's, it's a trust-based relationship that I um, that I get from referral. Gotcha. So kind of let them lead, establish the plan and just, like I said, just trust them. Yeah. They've probably done, if they're, you know, been doing this for 10 years or more, they've probably done 200 contracts. Like, Hey, what works best for you? And if there's a few things in there that you'd like to highlight and change, like negotiate for yourself. But good yeah. communication skills, it's a trust thing. I always tell people when they hire a contractor, it's like a marriage and most of them end in divorce. Mm. So hire who you, if, if somebody is, you know, 20% higher, but you trust them, mm. you, you honestly know them and you're just like, man, I just trust this person. I like them. I go with them because that's going to be the deciding factor. Gotcha. And then you, you mentioned like there were certain materials that you use in your units. Like how much of that is negotiated by the investor versus the contractors? Like, hey, I actually only use... X, Y, and Z materials when I build. Well, if you're if if you're the investor and you've done a hundred units, you're going to be like, hey, I, I want you to to build this, and I'm going to use your contract. But um, but if if we work together, I, I need you to follow this this guidebook, and we're going to use these materials. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to build your first ADU and you come to them and you're like, I want all these materials, they're probably going to say, no, we're actually going to use ours because they're efficient. We have um we have an economy of scale when we purchase and we'll pass that on to you and so forth and so so on. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on your experience level. Um, but there's a combination. Everything's negotiable. It's just like price. Like the, the price is just like a starting point. It doesn't mean it's what it's going to sell for. Same yeah. thing. Like you could have no experience and be really hard to work with and find a builder that'll work with you and, and say, Hey, I'm really insisting that we do this. Like, can we work together or not? Just be really clear and open uh, and honest and have everything in writing. Anything yep. that you can think of that you talk about, have it in writing. Um, not because you need to cover your butt, just because when you get in the heat of battle, you forget things that you said before. Yep. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah. Hey, Derek, one more question we haven't asked uh, the audience. How do you handle the money with contractors? What do you, What's your general advice for you know somebody who's looking at a two hundred fifty thousand dollar ADU build? How, how do you handle the money, the draws, if you will? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So I personally handle the money. Nobody ever bills me and gets paid until they're done. Like, but I have relationships. Part of um, what the pricing I get to is these are relationships I've had for decades. So there's there's never been a trust issue with people I use. Nobody gets money until it's done. That's the industry standard where I'm at. Uh, if you know somebody at all, you do not build them until you're done with the work. 
A lot of other areas do not work like that. Some people uh, going rate is like, I need 50% down to start the project. I wouldn't personally do that. I, I would make sure that um, there's X amount of work completed before X amount of money is released. I, I would say as smaller the percentage, the better. Okay, this is 100% of the project. We're going to give you 10% when the foundation's in. We're going to give you another 10% when the floor is down, another 10%. So they have these benchmarks to hit. Another thing that's nice to do is they say it's going to take six months. Hey, I'm going to give you an extra month. If you can do it in seven months, we're going to give you a $5,000 bonus. Yep. Any day that you go over seven months, it's $200 a day. Do you agree to that? I mean, you said you could do it in six. We're giving you a whole nother month. Like, uh, of course, they're going to sign that and go for that bonus. So um, give them an incentive. Charlie Munger has my favorite quote uh, when it comes to this. It's show me the incentive and I'll show you the result. And if you incentivize them to do quality work uh, on time, you're probably going to get that. But don't pay people uh, up front. Uh, never pay for more than 25% more work than they're going to do for what they're asking money for. That's another good rule. Very cool. Thanks, buddy. Jason, you got one one more question. You're good. Good. Uh, ben Reith, back to you. So um, my question is, um, how would you, starting like... Uh, um today like i live in southern california if i wanted to house hack and then add an adu how would you go about doing that um and also i have a bigger family so it's kind of a little like i would need like a little bigger house like a three two at least to to do that yeah yeah good good question i, I would be looking for a house that has uh, enough bedrooms for my family and it has enough room for my family to park okay just because we don't need to meet the parking standard in all these cases doesn't mean that we don't need a place you know to park and I would only be purchasing property that has good infrastructure in a good area on a semi-flat lot that has room to either do an attached ADU or build an ADU in the backyard or both. So I'm, I would look at, at, at your situation as you're going to house hack and you're also land hacking. So you're looking for a house that works now. You can't really afford it, but later on you're going to. You've already land banked that backyard. If you've got you know a 50 by 50 spot in the backyard with alley access... I mean, you just know in time that's either going to be another lot that you're going to condo it off and sell it, or you're going to build a house to move your parents into. So look at the zoning and the, the the space. Make sure you can do what you want to do. But a lot of times it just comes down to is there's enough is there is there enough room? Like I wouldn't buy a house that's on a small lot and the house is in the center of the lot where I couldn't build something in the backyard. That would be a no go for me. I wouldn't buy a perfect house hack in an area that doesn't allow the strategy I want, whether it's short-term rentals or ADUs. Like it's it's all got to line up. But the cool thing about not having the house yet, again, you're in that bucket that's way more advantageous. Uh, figure out your crystal clear criteria and then only only buy that. And would you go about doing the ADU first or do it fixing up like if you had to fix up the, the main house? Which no, no. You... I always try to stabilize the primary house first. My, my rule of thumb and in my expensive market is to buy a house that breaks even and then all the value add is where the cash flow comes from. But it, it's always about stabilizing the debt. So you got, you know, hopefully 30 year fixed rate debt, not at a low rate, but whatever today's rate is. Um, I wouldn't bank on low, like refine when it's lower. I know everybody's saying that, but just bank on paying that rate forever and it never goes down. Like if, if you're still stomaching that, um, you're fine. And then I would remodel the house before I did anything else. Something else just, just based on kind of how you're asking this is I would probably look for something that's ground floor that doesn't have a lot of steps. If you have a big family, like you, you don't want a 4,000 square foot house, but 2,000 square foot of it is not accessible to half the family as you're aging in place in multi-generational houses. So accessibility, when I say that people think parking, accessibility is also like can somebody with a mobility issue get into the shower or do they have to step over the tub? Do you have to climb five stairs just to get on the porch? So look for things that will fit your needs. And um, so when you're looking at places that are more desirable um, for people to rent, how do you think about um, the NIMBYism going about right now? Like how do you kind of, uh, if you have concerns of about parking and such, or like just like um, being able to put something at ADU in a in a spot, like with all the kind of the neighbors kind of pushing back on that. Great question. I mean, haters are going to hate. So I only um, buy in properties where I can do ADUs by right. And with that said, the neighbors can say what they want, and you know it doesn't matter. 
it also wears on me. Like every time I, I do one of these, a lot of these, I house hack, like I'll buy the house and I'll live in it while I'm building the units and while I'm splitting the lot. And then I move into the back one. Like I'm moving all the time, you know, every year uh, to these places. So I, I have a lot of experience with this question. What happens is you go talk to the, I go talk to the neighbors. Hey, I just bought this house. We're going to build this cool unit in the backyard. And they just nod and smile. And then within a month, they usually call the city and complain. Um, and the city says, Hey, no, actually that's an allowable use. You can do it the whole time I'm building. The neighbors don't like me. They're looking over the fence and scowling at me. And then right when it's almost done, um, usually like the last month or so they'll, they'll say, Hey, can I, do you mind if I come take a look? Of course, you know, I'm trying to influence people and create a million ADUs in my life. How am I going to do that by like being cold and, and putting up a wall? No, it's like, come look. And then every time without, without exception, like one to three to six months after it's completed, that neighbor will call me directly and ask if I can give them some pointers on building their own. Mm -hmm. So what it comes down to is people don't like change. Okay. They they've always looked over your yard that they, they feel like their view over your yard is theirs. And NIMBY, for those of you that don't know, stands for not in my backyard. And like the, you know, like the, the American in me is like, this is bullshit. Like not in my backyard. Well, this isn't in your backyard. This is in my backyard. So mind your own business. But that's not the diplomatic way to approach it. The way to approach it is this is an awesome product. I'm, I'm really sorry. Like if I was you, I wouldn't want to see this either. I can like have compassion um, and then try to influence them to, hey, you know what? You guys are getting older. Have you ever thought of building an ADU in the backyard to age in place and maybe letting your kids buy their first home in your front house? So just try to, to educate them. But it's a, it's a sticky subject. And to be completely honest and like just throw it all out here, like it wears on me. Like every time I do a project and the neighbors don't like me, like it wears on you. Like we want to be liked and it's hard and it does, um, you know, add a layer to the job that you can't really put on a spreadsheet. But I know at the end of the day, what I'm doing is, is right. And I know now based on experience that it's not a personal thing. They don't dislike that ADU guy. They dislike the noise and somebody building back where they used to just look over the top and not see anything. And at the end of the day, they're interested in the product too. So I, we just have to stay focused and do the right thing, treat people right, and honestly try to add value to them. Like the neighbors that throw spears at me, uh, in the end, I end up helping them. So it's it's this long cycle to like get your like kind of the um, the respect and reputation back. But in the end, you know, like I said, I've done it enough now that I know it's going to work. There you go. Well, Derek, this has been an amazing two hours. Thank you very much for helping people. Where can people find you? Follow you? Maybe put your phone number maybe in the chat for the for the group that way you don't get thousands of calls from YouTube people, but um, where can people follow you? <laughs> yeah. You know, the best way to to follow me is to go to that adu guy.com. My number's at the top of the page. There's a link to my Instagram. I'm probably most active on my Instagram account. And then I open source everything I do on YouTube, literally how to build an ADU with cost breakdown. I go through all the steps. There's long form video and you can email me that ADU guy at Gmail. Everything's on my website, that ADU guy.com or that ADU guy on any platform you like, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Um, but I just tell people, if you reach out to me uh, to be ready to take action, you get a lot of calls where people call me and they just say, hey, I didn't think you would answer. And I'm like, of course, how can I help you? And they don't have a question. So don't be that person. And I do offer consultations, but I always talk people out of it when I can. Go watch all the free content. Yeah. I, mean, I have 350 videos on YouTube that are all questions people have asked me. Go watch those playlists. If you have a garage that you want to convert, I've got 36 videos on the garage conversion playlist. Look through the playlists and see if it's in line with what you want to do. And only after all that, if you haven't gotten your questions answered, then you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with me. But but don't do that. Like Save your money for your build. Very cool, man. I appreciate you. Enjoy the rest of your day, Derek. You're amazing. That A to you guys, folks. Thank you so much. Thank you.